Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Sorry I'm late. I uh, had some technical issues here in the studio. In this world of fake, fake it till you make it, I think it's really nice to see a project that has the chance to, to actually make it or break it. But, yeah. <laughs> but later on, later on, uh, on, uh, on this, we, we touch a bit uh, deeper. But first, I want to let you know about is that I made a core pass ID. So mm -hmm. if you have the data, you definitely know me now, but I don't know you. <laughs> so who is who is Oki? Who is Okeret Lobster? And who is Michael Lobster? And who is who is the whole project? If you could elaborate a little bit on yourselves and the team. Sure. Uh, firstly, I will tell you, I don't know who you are um, because I don't have access to the data. So, <laughs> so currently you know who you are, but I don't. <laughs> so, uh, but um, yeah, to to give you a bit of a brief um, introduction of us. Um, so, my father and I. So, Michael Oakshire is my father. Uh, he and I have been in business since two thousand and three. Uh, we have built several different projects. Um, actually, one of our starting projects was a closed loop banking system and accountability system. Basically, it was it was more of like a, um, a decentralized accountability, which was working on POS systems. So these little POS terminals that everyone was doing credit cards and things like this. But before they actually started, we already utilized it. It was called a PAX device. And um, we basically built it for a very interesting industry in South Africa, which was the funeral industry. And it's basically what was happening uh, happening in uh, South Africa, you have pay points where um, trucks go out to actually pay pensions and all kinds of things. And they go and collect their premiums for their customers at these pay points. But they used to use manual receipt books and basically um, when uh, it was time to to take the money back to the office, the receipt book would disappear and so would some of the money. So they never had a, an, a collection of who actually paid and who didn't pay. And then basically what we did is, is we built the system, which was on the POS system using GPRS networks. Um, and we, back in those days, I mean, we didn't have a name or anything for it, but it was basically like tokenization. Um, the data wasn't stored on the device itself. It was actually stored through distributed ledgers. Wow. And um, was uh, this was in 2003 and 2004, five, six. Um, yeah. And um, we built this system and it's... Um, actually had a debit card or not a debit card, but like a, like a type of a debit card, but it was just a normal card with a mag strip and also a uh, chip that you could insert. Um, and we basically had there the premium policies and things and we had to do it via messages. You were very limited with the messages that you could send. I think only 32 characters could be sent on a message. So you had to have like sub menus and all kinds of things that were cross communicating and it was a very interesting time. Um, we rolled that out. It was very successful. And then, of course, my father and I did several other uh, businesses also. Um, I also ran an advertising agency, uh, which was doing from website development right through to billboards, to manufacturing of billboards, to wrap, car wrapping, car branding, all kinds of things. Also, even um, digital content uh, for um, you know advertisements and these types of things. So we were making also videos and stuff like that. And then my father and I decided that we would come to Slovakia um, and we came to Slovakia. We uh, started developing another uh, company. Um, uh, hello, are you there? Yes, I am. I just unpinned uh, myself because uh, as I am melting into the amazing <laughs> information, I think uh, uh, the viewers should uh, uh, look at you, not me uh, looking at uh, you. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Um, so basically, so what we did is, is when we arrived in Slovakia, we started with um, uh, several other other little deals that we did. Um, we also went into renewable energy and biodiesel and these types of things. And uh, we also were at the same time, we were busy building what was back then called TV Mall. Um, TV Mall was basically like an application for Tizen, uh, for the Tizen, Tizen smart TVs. 
which then actually utilized, it was interactive media basically, but by, uh, but what we did is, is we utilized the camera on top of the television um, to actually also map and uh, layer clothing or layer whatever you wanted to buy. Um, but the biggest challenge that we ran into for this e-commerce uh, store that was running on your TV was basically um, splitting of payments. And we spoke a lot, well, I, I was fighting a lot with uh, Stripe to check out, uh, scroll, uh, authorize.net, uh, with banks itself for merchant accounts. And I asked them to split the payment because otherwise, if you're ordering the products, then um, you can't make it with a single payment. You basically, because we didn't want to hold the money on behalf of a merchant, we wanted it directly paid into the merchant's account. Um, and we wanted it to make it easier to allow the user to pay with one single transaction. Um, and we actually met Rastislav in 2013, who is, um, Michael's our chairman, I'm the CEO and Rastislav is our CIO. Um, so basically when we met Rastislav, uh, in 2013, he helped us to develop these types of things and, uh, he became part of the development team and then, um, Rastislav heard me fighting the whole time and he was actually the one that said, well, why don't you use, you know, Bitcoin? <laughs> and I was a bit of like, mm, uh, mm, uh, and Rastislav explained me a lot more technically how the technology worked. So Rastislav and myself went to my father and we explained to my father how, um, <laughs> how this would work. And um, I imagine but, you had in 2013 uh, <laughs> being also yourself a little for doubter, explaining this to your father and trying to concern him about the technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say I was a doubter, and then Rastislav convinced me that it is actually something really amazing. So then I said, okay, well, if that's the case, then let's do that. So then we went to my father, we explained it. My father said, okay, interesting. He said, Give me some time. Let me think about it. Let me do some research. And then my father called myself and Rastislav and we sat in his house in the kitchen. Actually, the, the whole company started out. I was working out of my own apartment and with my dad and his apartment. And then we worked. Uh, we then moved into one apartment, like a small little apartment. And Rastislav and myself started working there. Um, and uh, basically, yeah, we went to, to my dad's apartment, sat in his kitchen. And I'll never forget it. He said, uh, guys, I have come to a conclusion. <laughs> None of these blockchains or this Bitcoin can do what we want to do. We're going to build our own. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, <laughs> Rastislav and myself looked at my father. We said, are you, um, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> in in much different words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine. <laughs> and then um, uh, my dad said, "Well, I, I, stuff said, do you, do, do you have any idea how much work this is?" And um, uh, Michael said, "I don't. So tell me." And uh, Rastislav and myself sat there, and we said, uh, we looked at each other, we spoke a little, and then we said, "Okay, well, probably six years, uh, nine years down the line, we released the blockchain." <laughs> but um, yeah, basically, so what we did is is um, we built the um, the core blockchain, which is the Edwards Curve ED448, um, and uh, it uh, basically uh, does five coins per block. Uh, it's a mining coin which uses CPU mining, um, so it's proof of work. But we actually um, uh, we changed the algorithm to what is called uh, random Y. Um, and it is focused on proof of distributed efficiency, basically. So, which means all focused on IoT devices. So, for about one kilo hash, it's about six to uh, eight watts. Um, just to give you a comparison, one light bulb uh, uses about 60 watts. So, you can have anything between eight to 10 of an, uh, IoT devices mining uh, for the same electricity consumption that you are running a, um, a, a light. With. What is what the is next this, thing? What is this in layman's terms? Like for really simplify it for the viewers. It's basically you can run six IoT devices. Uh, they're about they're 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 smaller than this telephone. Uh, you can run six to 
So uh, let's say anything between eight to ten, six to ten. Let's let's put it like that. Um, of these devices, depending on what device it is and things, but you can basically plug six to ten of those in and they can actually mine, which means that they actually earn the coins. Because what they're doing is, is they're actually proving transactions and proving blocks, because blo uh, transactions are bolted into blocks, and then blocks need to be mined. So there are six blocks that needs to be verified okay. uh, for a transaction. The data is instantaneously available. Um, so basically, it takes about, um, it, it's about seven seconds per block. So this is around about 42 seconds. We love uh, we, we love this this coincidence. It wasn't planned, but if you know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer is 42 to life. And, um, and you know the answer why? To and, you know why? <laughs> and you know why 42? No, that would be actually interesting. That, I, actually, I'm into numerology really much because I'm trading on, on the markets and uh, I take a good use of it. And 42 is actually 4 plus 2, which means 6, and 6 is the origin. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I read that. That that is actually, yeah, that's brilliant. But it, it and six blocks. Yeah, man, everything just makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, so basically, uh, just to not to go on the sideways, because while you were talking and I was like uh, consuming the information, it came into my mind, if you can uh, just plug in six devices at your home and you need only six confirmations for a blog then can't you just confirm it for yourself uh no uh basically let me explain to you how it works a blockchain is an entirely decentralized ledger which works it it it's not in one place so you don't cluster everything in one place because then actually make it centralized so it is distributed across the entire world at uh, different nodes different environments and the blockchain cannot be stopped so once it's run uh, running, it can't be stopped because everyone that participates that's running a node, that's running a mining or something like this means that you have to find every single individual of where they've got a computer, which is actually utilizing it or running the software. You need to shut that down to be able to shut it down. We already have tens of thousands of nodes out yeah. in the market. We already have, we're, we're so distributed. We have um, thousands and thousands of miners. We don't actually know how many miners, but we have really a lot. And what I can say is, is um, we have a, a, you can do solo mining, you can do pool mining. There's, there's, there, there's a lot of differences, but you see what, it, what is the interesting part is, is having the blockchain and having an immutable ledger, which is like a, a, a you don't have the means to, to alter the ledger. So if I'm sending you one core coin, you uh, cannot change it uh, in a ledger. So it's not like an Excel spreadsheet that you can go in and alter it, alter the date or anything. It is immutable. It means it was hashed into the blockchain, into the network, and you cannot change that historical data. Unreversible, right? Yes. Yes. And this is the power actually of this network. But what is very important is now, this is basically blockchain, just explaining blockchain. But what is extremely important is what can you do with blockchain? Now, yes, you can transact and send to peers where there's no middleman that is actually um, participating. So like if I would send you one euro in a SEPA network, there's multiple banks that are participating, which are acting as middlemen which goes from one bank to another bank to another bank, and then it will enter into your bank. Um, but what we've done is, is with blockchain and and everyone else in blockchain itself, why it's such a a, um, a going concern, is because it is um, a peer to peer decentralized payment system that allows for two peers to directly send um, the asset to each other without any third party interfering. No blocking of the wallet can take place. No one can stop the wallet. No one can stop the individual from sending it. So um, this makes it an extremely powerful tool. But to make this useful, you need smart contracts. Because if you want to put it into real world applications and uh, utilize real world assets and bring other things in, you need something that can actually house fest this and 
act as the middlemen, but it is basically decentralized. It is coded and it is executed automatically. And um, basically, this is what smart contracts uh, do. They are software components which works with the blockchain itself that actually allows peers to do more with the network. So you can attach data, you can attach certain execution, you can split payments, um, you can uh, do basically anything with a smart contract because it becomes the executor, which is what Core Token, a uh, smart contract platform actually is, and which is why we built a coin and a token. So the token is a utility token, which is the means of being of uh, paying for the services itself that is being offered within our entire ecosystem. Because basically what we build is a decentralized circular economy and basically a platform as an economy. So what it means is, is um, you have the native currency of the blockchain itself, which is the coin. The coin is required to pay to the miners itself to hash the transactions and to prove the reward, uh, the, the, the blocks, which is what, where the rewards are being paid out from to the miners itself, and your transactions can go through. So you don't know who's verifying your transaction, and um, they don't know who they're verifying for. It's like a it's like a blind business when uh, yes. when, when, it reminds me to when somebody wants to sell something on the market without knowing uh, uh, their their uh, buyer or the customer who wants to buy something yeah. without knowing their uh, their uh, um, uh, merchant because obviously they are communicating through two intermediary like their own agents right because you yes. know it's it it only came to my mind now i was wondering before already why you need a coin and a token separately it starts to crystallize now yeah it is look the important thing is is with the core token itself now you you did core pass so one of the first use cases that we went and built um if you want to be in an economy that um, is active and allow people to participate in it, you need to be able to identify it, specifically with regulation that is coming in right now and a lot of jurisdictions actually allowing for regulation to take place. Regulation means compliancy and it means AML uh, for anti-money laundering. So to be able to be a, a coin that can really be utilized and a token that can really be utilized or let's say a blockchain that can really be utilized in the real world you need to be able to identify the um to to identify um either the thing the individual um who is uh transacting so basically what we did is is we built corpus which right now is only for end consumers uh, to be able to verify and digitize their government issued documents and what happens is is with the core pass when you want to do this this is a smart contract that actually takes place it doesn't actually issue you a digital identity on behalf of a government what it does is, is it takes your government issued documents and it then allows you to be able to digitize them and when you digitize them you need to have a form of trust so to have a form of trust you then need to go through a kyc process where the document gets verified of the authenticity of it and then there's various checks that actually takes place because if you want to own the data but you want to use the data and monetize the data you need to give some form of value to it so what is valuable is that it is your data. And if you have an AML check and you have all the various checks, which you are now in control of instead of other platforms that you're providing your data to, um, and you don't know what they're doing with that data, you are now actually taking the core pass and you're putting yourself into the control of doing that. Um, right now, we are using a third party service provider which is called SumSub. SumSub is a very reliable, very trusted, very good name in the market itself, um, which is being utilized by very large um, uh, uh, institutions also to do their KYC processes. So we basically partnered with them, became like a type of a partner, and uh, we are digitizing the documents. And then uh, it's a direct, uh, a direct uh, data transfer from SumSub to your individual phone 
The nicest part about that is, is that it's stored on your local device. It's not stored in any servers. We don't have access to the data. We don't want to have access to the data, making it fully GDPR compliant. Now you can back it up and do all kinds of things, but to be able to do that, you needed to use Core Token to pay for the services and you needed Core Coin to actually hash the transactions in and hash the fingerprints, not the actual data, the fingerprints of each field into the blockchain itself. So having the digital identity, it's all good and well. What can you do with it? So first thing that we said is, is well, let's build a new form of two-factor authentication and website login because now the individual can prove who they say they are. They have a wallet, which is also in the blockchain, which is immutable, where the data is actually also um, manifested uh, or linked to um, the decentralized storage, basically. But in the blockchain itself, you can actually do a prompt to check whether KYC data is there basically becoming your first form of digital attributes, which in essence is actually a real world asset, RWA. So what happens now is, is when you go onto a website and you scan a QR code with the core pass, you're actually creating an account. And then there's a communication, which is a peer to peer communication, which is first happening to the blockchain itself, then stipulating with or verifying that the wallet is active, that it has got the digital attributes attached to it. And then the second QR code that you will go and scan is the smart contract, which is initiating, which is then identifying um, the entity that is requesting the data. And it, the, the smart contract is basically the one that is stipulating what is the data that is required by the entity for the registration to take place. So the smart contract then actually executes the um, connection, which is on a peer to peer basis between the individual and the website itself, and then prompting a data request where the individual then has to accept it and sign for it. Now, how do they sign? That is through a little means of uh, anti cheating model, which is like a type of form of staking for a few seconds. But basically what it is, is, is both parties the requester, which is the website, pays double the amount of um, of uh, 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 tokens that they're going to pay for the data from the holder of the data or the owner of the data. So they pay double the amount to the smart contract. The holder of the amount pays um, a sing pays the exact amount to the smart contract. Then the data transfer actually ex executes so that uh, the data can actually be received by the um uh, by the, 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 the entity itself, which creates a new form of trust because this is not an IOU or anything. This is like a little treasury, which is then saying, okay, I'm holding both your coins and your tokens on behalf of you until you have processed this transaction and then I'll automatically release it. So then what happens is, is the individual then receives the amount that they paid back, plus they receive the amount of the value, which is um, uh, then actually an earning that they've earned by providing their data because the entity is purchasing the data from the, the uh, individual. Yeah, so literally you're saying that as long as I have a KYC centralized, I am a product. And once I will have this ID and use this ID, actually I can charge for my data if I want, or otherwise I can use this data to choose who I share it to. Yes. And who d who I don't. Uh, that yes. takes out of business a lot of uh, agencies who are dealing with taking you off the internet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but are you aware of any kind of uh, competition right now who really compete with you either with technology or with their own network that makes their product, uh, um, that puts their product in front of yours? What I can say is, is I don't think there's many projects that are as crazy as us. We <laughs> <laughs> build as much as what we did That's over the last poor value. 11 years. <laughs> yes. Um, what I can say is, look, there are many amazing 
platforms out there. There are whether they're networks or whether they're blockchains. And what I mean with networks is is they're not actually blockchains, but they perceive themselves as blockchains. But a, a true blockchain is a fully decentralized L1 proof of work um, blockchain. That's that's my perception. That's my opinion. Um, but uh, you know, as soon as you go into forms of staking or things like this, then you become a network because you're central and large entities that hold a lot more are the ones that are in control of the network. I will, I will cut this part out and repeat it at least three times for people because this would be the most crucial thing first to understand about blockchain and, and being decentralized <laughs> and all core values. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no problem. So, um, but this is subject to my opinion, okay? <laughs> um, uh, what I can say is, is there are a lot of projects out there. The biggest challenge that you have is, is, you know, if you have a look at Coinbase and if you have a look at, you know, Solana and, you know, Solana is a network and Solana um, has created their digital identity, but it's not a decentralized digital identity like ours. We have decentralized storage. So out of a digital identity perspective, there is no blockchain that or, or no, no, no platform that actually competes with what we've built because it puts the user entirely in control of their own assets. Um, we don't have access to it and it is entirely on a peer to peer permission basis that allows you as an individual to be able to uh, identify yourself and decide whether you want to provide the, the, the information or not. The nicest part is, is, is that the information can be trusted. The next important aspect is, is also out of an entity or a receiver, the receiver can then decide according to the data that they have paid for to be able to decide whether they will deliver the service or whether they will, um, uh, uh, you know, engage with the individual um, should they uh, decide to do so because now they have an informed, trusted um, uh, information that they can make a proper uh, educated decision from. And this is the whole principle of our entire ecosystem because having a digital identity, now we as individuals, as um, I think the best way to place it is, is living organisms, um, then uh, basically we come with things. Uh, we have property, we have investments, we have wives, husbands, partners, children, dogs, uh, whatever. We own businesses. We, um, you know, we, we, we buy clothing. We, we do all kinds of things. And all of these things can actually be digitized. As long as I can prove my ownership or relationship, then I can basically place it in as a digital attribute, which can then actually be transacted. If I can place a value to that, then basically I have a digital commodity. So uh, from a real world asset. Now, the important aspect is, is what we did is, is having the blockchain, having the digital identity, we then went and built a decentralized MasterCard network, a settlement network that can settle, and it's not just a financial settlement, it's a data settlement network. The data settlement network allows you to settle anything, which means the smart contracts, everything can settle within 42 seconds with the real assets itself, regardless of whether it's a currency, whether it's a fiat or not a fiat, or whether it is another crypto, or whether it is a t-shirt, or whether it's a, um, a silo of corn, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the settlement with the real assets can actually be instantaneously settled. The nicest part about this is, is that it's um, this whole system itself can be run in the Luna Mesh, which is a decentralized mesh network that has the means to be able to be distributed 98% over the world. And when I say 98%, that's not just continents, that includes oceans. The most beautiful part about this is, is that it's basically like it creates little clusters of swarms, which has got decentralized storage, decentralized connectivity, which the blockchain and the settlement network and everything can actually run on. And it's all based on peer to peer. 